The thing that we're going to cover today is theoretical background of 2EFT. The important part here is to understand how we got to this point. Why is EFT working? What are the driving factors that create safety for EFT? The reason we want to go about and discuss the theoretical background to EFT is because we need to understand how it works. It's very difficult to run the modality with your clients if you don't understand the background and theory that drives it. And uh, we've learned before that, that this theory consists of multiple theories. So the emotional focus therapy is the experiential model. It's not a theory by itself. It combines multiple theories to create one coherent model of treating couples distress, individual distress, and also families distress. Well, let's start with the goal of the EFT therapist. That's our goal. What are we doing with this? The first thing we do is to help clients to move into existential living. And existential living is very important versus existential fears. Most of the clients will walk into our, our therapy room and they're going to talk about their existential fears. Something like, I'm scared that my partner doesn't love me. I'm scared that this is as good as it gets. It's never going to get better. I'm scared that we're going to lose each other and our relationship will deteriorate until we get a divorce or we separate, right? That's an existential fear. So many relationships that are, that are under stress live in existential fear. So what we need to do, we need to help them to live in existential living. Then we open to the experiences. We live moment to moment fully without fears. We are able to experience our internal emotions and feelings and know that what we're experiencing is valid. I mean, nobody can tell us that they're not valid. They are valid just because they're mine. It also allows us to do, enables choices in taking responsibility. There's so many great things come out from existential living, but this is our goal. Take the client from existential fears into existential living. Next one is to help clients to move into accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement with the other around them, especially people who are important to them, especially people they love and people who love them. And this is where the ARE acronym comes from. ARE acronym says that in our daily life, we need to be accessible responsive and engaged with our partner. So big question that comes up for both partners. Are you there for me when I need you? Are you there for me when I need you? And that first part, R, A-R-E, is are you accessible? Are you responsive? Are you engaged with me when I need you? And that's a big part of it is when I need you means in the moments when I'm stressed, in the moments when I'm worried, in the moments I want to share something, these are moments we're looking for. It's not a, that you have to do it every single moment of your life, but in the moments that count, can I be accessible, responsive, and engaged? So that's what we're going to help our clients to move into. The next one is we want to foster secure bonding. And secure bonding means that you rely on your partner to be there for you in the moments of stress. And when you go out and fight the world, and you go on into the jungle outside of your castle, you know that there's a person who is waiting for you. You know that you're not alone when you come home. And finally, our goal as a therapist is increase the likelihood of individual growth and resilience. And that's an important part. We cannot make person grow and become resilient, but we can increase the likelihood by being providing unrelenting empathy, accessing emotional, creating corrective emotional experience that we're going to discuss a little bit later. And that will prepare a person to, to their growth and to their resilience. Because as Carl Rogers said, we have innate need to grow. And we have innate need to, to self-actualize. So what we're doing is helping people to grow, self-actualize, and become resilient to emotional distress or relationship distress. Because if they're not resilient to emotional distress or relationship distress, then they cannot be accessible, responsive, and engaged. So that's why it's such an important task. So whenever you walk into the therapy room, 
these four things need to be on your background as, as a foundation of where you sit them. Can I move the clients to the existential living? Can I help them to become accessible, responsive, and engaged? Can I foster the secure bonding with their loved ones? Can I help them not only improve their relationship, but also an individual growth and resilience to a relationship stress? That's where, that's where we need to live when we see our clients. So the next one, we're just going to discuss attachment theory. It's a big subject, so I kind of summarize it here. But without understanding attachment theory, we may miss the opportunity to help our clients. John Balby wrote that the cradle to the grave, we're hardwired to seek social contact, physical and emotional proximity to people we care about. From the cradle to the grave, that means there's no time in our life that we don't want to feel uh, safely connected to another person. It does not mean that we cannot have our time for ourselves. That's also good. You, you want to be able to uh, have a hobbies, you want to be able to uh, explore world, you want to be able to do things that are important to you. But from the cradle to the grave, we constantly seek social contact, physical and emotional proximity. That's a part of the attachment team. And what's important here is that we're looking for predictable connections. We're not looking for random connections. We're not looking at intermittent connections. In fact, intermittently reinforcing bonding or emotional connection is very dangerous because we continuously going to try to get back to that secure connection and without any response from your partner and you can get burned out so we're looking for predictable physical and emotional connection with people who care about us and people who we care about and and that's an important point because we need to know who is important to us our, our primary caregivers they're important to us the people we love the people we marry people we uh, we um, live with our children, our grandchildren, maybe extended family. There could be many different things. Recently, I was on the LinkedIn and one person made a post and, and he said, don't worry about how other people think about you. And I couldn't pass up this post. So I, I, I responded to it. We can't live like this. We can't live with not thinking how my wife can respond to you. I can't live this way. I will always think how she responds to me and I'm going to try to be to create predictable physical and emotional connection with her. I'm thinking about my children, how they're going to respond to me, how I'm going to respond to them. So, so the predictable is the key. If you do it just once in a while or only after you had a big fight with your wife, that's an intermittent reinforcement. And that creates a loop or a cycle that's very devastating to the relationship. So our goal is to help clients to become predictable, consistent when your partner reaches out for support and they feel safe that you have the resilience to respond even when you're upset yourself or even when you're unbalanced yourself. That's a statement that we're kind of trying to achieve. Can I be there for my wife when she reaches out to me? without bringing my own anxiety or worry or, or frustration and knowing that she can help me with it once she's balanced and feels safe. When we're securely connected in physically and emotionally, everything comes down. You can go to work and work really hard and come home. You can do your hobbies. You can be creative. You can have new goals, build a new... Uh, ideas for the future, plan the trips, right? But when we don't have predictable connection with people we love and people we care about, everything gets shut down and we get stuck. I, I refer to this a lot of times as we have a car and engine is running and the wheels are spinning, but you're on ice. You're on ice and you don't go anywhere. You just get stuck in that place and, and there's no place to go. So to, be, to have a place where you can come back and get comfort and reassurance and restore your emotional balance, that's what we want uh, between two people who care about each other. And that can relate to your intimate partner. It can also relate to your coworkers at work. It can relate to your parents, parents-in-law, sisters, brothers, siblings, aunts and aunts, uncles. 
wherever there's a social proximity with other people, that's what we want to establish. And that's what the attachment theory said. We're looking for predictability. When, we're, when things are not predictable, we go into anxiety. The other concept is called emotional balance. When we're not securely attached, if we get dysregulated, let's say my partner said something that I found maybe blaming or critical, there are several ways I can react. If I'm securely attached, my reaction will be a little bit of escalation and then de-escalations and we're together again. But we're emotionally unbalanced, my response can be disproportional to what my partner said, whether it's uh, becoming angry and or shutting down, whether it's uh, name calling, whether it's uh, uh, gaslighting, whatever it is comes out, we definitely get unbalanced in that period of time. So emotional balance will help us to stay grounded. That means not only we need to rely on our partner to help us to regulate our emotions, which is great, but sometimes partners can do it. We also need to rely on ourselves to be able to regulate our emotions. So there's no big excursions in the, in the emotional affect to the point where both of you are afraid of each other on the emotional level and then sometimes physical level, right? But you have a little bit of escalation, but then your partner comes back, hey, I see something's happening, I'm right here. And then you're able to tell yourself, okay, I can see that our cycle starts, but I don't want to lose my partner. I don't want to disconnect. I want to go to bed and, and, and feel caring and loving for each other. And then de-escalate. And then you can reassure each other. You know, right now it's 11 o'clock, we need to go to sleep, but let's get to, uh, in the morning together or when you come back, back from work and let's figure out what happened, how we got unbalanced. That's what we're looking for. Uh, and that allows people to to have a coherent understanding who they are as a person and who they are in the relationship. Part four of this attachment theory is to develop a secure base, a felt sense of being able to depend on a loved one. So when you have a secure base, it's like a ship. Let's take any ship goes out to the sea. It's all replenished, has all the food, the, gas, uh, the fuel, everything is there and it goes out to the sea and then after six months in the sea, you know, the, all the provisioning is, uh, is getting low, fuel getting low, everybody tired, working 12-hour shifts, everybody wants to get to, on the ground. And when they come to, uh, to, to home, they have people who love them. And they say, okay, I can replenish, I can rebuild, I can feel safe, and I can go out to the world and I can fight the monsters. But having that innate feeling that I have a secure base from which I can explore the rest of the world, the rest of the experiences, I can explore working on my physique, okay? I can explore working on going to school, learning new, new skills, I can, I can take classes, I, I, I can have hobbies, or I can go work hard to make sure that I can provide financial stability for, for my family. And I know when I get hurt at work, when things are not good, I can come home and there is a secure base. My wife, my husband will wait for me and will help me with whatever happening for me. And, and that's when we have a secure base. We can be at the same time close to our partner and have effective dependence. And at the same time to have autonomy to go out and do what we need to do. The next thing is when a person have a perceived accessibility, responsiveness, and emotional engagement with people they care about. And this is an important part, perceived. Our senses, when we love other people, our senses get heightened. The old adage that the people who love you the most hurt you the most is absolutely correct here. Because when we love someone, we get fine-tuned to their physical expressions, body language, tone of voice, loudness of voice, gestures, facial expression, eyes expression, all of this we constantly monitor for one thing. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Right? It's like a little ping. It constantly goes out. Are you there for me? Are you there for me? Are you there for me? 
So the perceived accessibility, responsiveness, and emotional engagement means that you're going to get ping back saying, yeah, I'm here for you. I'm accessible. Yeah, I'm responsive. Yes, I'm engaged. I can take care of this. But this is what the key factors in quality and security of connection bond. This is a key factor that constantly allows us to maintain long-term relationship when we're able to have accessibility, responsiveness, and, and emotional engagement. Lola and I, we married this year, is going to be 43 years. But one of the things that nobody ever told us when we got married, how to have a relationship. If only we would know that accessibility, responsiveness, and emotional engagement is the key, we would, a lot of things would be different. Not knowing, we had to kind of model our way through this. I, at some point, I was telling Lola, 30 years into marriage, I said, I think I have I have five, I had five wives because every five years my wife changed. Now I didn't realize that she didn't change, I changed, but it looked like my wife changed. So this is a part of this attachment theory, and we can teach our young adults and, and teenagers how to have this relationship. And and the information that they can gain will help them throughout their lives. So perceived accessibility, responsiveness, and emotional engagement is the key. And the separation distress comes up when the bond is threatened. And why is it threatened? Is when we ask, are you there for me? And the person says, no, or maybe. Maybe I'm not accessible. I'm not responsive. I'm not emotionally engaged. Then the separation distress starts. And that's the hardest thing to do because when we feel the separation distress, we will do everything we can to reconnect. And the strategies we use are typically going to hurt our relationship because nobody ever teaches the strategy how to reconnect with our partners. In a parent-child relationship, relationship, the parent will tell the child what they need to do. And if the child is distressed, they say, no, just do it. You don't have to ask the questions. And now the child is in a, in a distress. Are you, Mama, you're accessible to me, you're responsive, are you emotionally engaged with me? Or are you just telling me what to do? That's the part of the attachment theory. Separation distress will threaten the bond. When connection is lost, we go into distress. When we get in distress, we have action tendencies that create more distress. And eventually, it escalates. And you all know what happens when, when kid gets uh, disconnected from their parents. They misbehave. And what do kids, parents do? They send them to therapy, not realizing that they need to be part of that interaction. And then emotional and physical isolation from people we care about is traumatizing. It's traumatizing so when a person shuts down and stops responding to their partner's request to connect, it's not just feeling uncomfortable. It's just not feeling like, well, he's not, he's not connecting with me. It's a physical pain of trauma. And people who are pursuers, and we'll talk about this uh, withdrawal pursuer in, in a minute, people who fight for connection, they can go into physical distress. You know, people who protect connection by withdrawing, like withdrawers, they shut down and numb out so they don't feel as much pain. They don't feel as much stress because they're able to compartmentalize things and shut down things, become numb, and just focus on the task. But people who are fighting for a relationship, they can't do this. And they've experienced a physical pain. Most of the time, they will tell you their pain is in, in their stomach, their pain is in, in their chest, their pain is in their uh, lower body, you know, in the pelvic area. All of these are related to emotional and physical isolation. How many times you can talk to clients and they say, we haven't talked for three days. We had a big blowout. We didn't talk for three days, for five days. To the point where some clients come in and say, we don't talk for weeks before we reconnect. Well, that's not talking. Is emotional and physical isolation for both partners. This is creates sense of danger and helplessness. This is when you tell yourself, I can't do it anymore. If I'm if I have to suffer so much, maybe I should just leave. That's how stressful that is. So one of the key factors in working with couples is 
to help them minimize emotional or, physic or physical isolation and to be available for their partner, even if they're stressed themselves. The other part of the attachment theory is that to create a secure connection, we need to have a secure interaction. We have to respond in certain ways. A regular interaction doesn't work most of the time because in the regular interaction, when people get stressed, they go into content. You did this, I did this, you did this, I did this. It never ends. So I, I would say that discord between two people lives in content all the time. The only time to resolve any discord is to go into emotional processing. And when I say emotional processing, it doesn't mean you need to be a therapist for your partner, but understanding what's happening on the emotional level. We call it the heart level, and we call it going to a basement. So when you work with clients, you can say, do you mind if I take both of you by your hands and we'll go into the elevator and we'll push the button and go down, down, down to your heart, right to the basement, and we can talk from that place. And then we're going to turn the door, we're going to close the doors to the elevators and you won't be able to get back until we finish today. But based on this, we develop protocols of responding. Our relationship and our bonding changes if we have negative interact interaction or we have a positive interaction. Bonding increases with positive interaction. Bonding decreases with negative interactions. So uh, one of the things that we do in EFT, we create corrective emotional experience so that the interaction changes. Because whatever couple does, it doesn't work. They, be, they may be doing it for 10 years, 15 years before they have the courage to call us and, and, and be invited and, and come to the therapy, right? The goal is here is to help them, to help them with the protocol. And that's why we, it's an experiential model and that's why we practice it during the therapy so they can take that out of the room, go home and try to do the same thing at home. So what's interesting that it's quite possible to be insecure in one relationship and secure in the other relationship. If you're insecure in one relationship, does not mean that you cannot have a secure relationship in another interact in relationship here. Yeah. So for example, you can be insecure with your partner, but very secure with your, with your mother. Because depending on how each person responds in your constellation, you will, de will determine how secure you are in that particular relationship. We already know how to be secure and how to create a secure connection. Attentive, responsive, engaged, that's the key. All this question, are you there for me? Are you there for me? Yes, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. What's interesting about this, that it never diminishes the intensity of need. That means you can live with a person for 10, 15, 20 years, but just the way you get hungry next day, even if you had a great meal the day before, that's how you get hungry for that reassurance that we're still connected, that we're still close to each other, that everything is okay. Having those check-ins to know where you are with your partner is important. We'll talk about this. Uh, there's nothing wrong with people saying, you know, I'm secure with one relationship, I'm insecure with another relationship. Now there's even more about this. You can be secure with your partner on one subject of conversation and insecure on the other subject of conversation. For example, a partner may say, you know, we're secure when we talk about household and take care of everything, you know, take care of our kids, take care of our day-to-day -day life, uh, financial investment. We have no problem doing this. We're really good. We're actually super couple when it comes to this. But when we talk about our relationship, when we talk about us and we try to resolve our difficulties, we're insecure. We get so stressed and we always end up fighting. So internally, we ask two questions. Now, this is simplified ways. Of course, we're going to go a little bit more in details in other chapters. But the first question, simplified question, say, says, are you there for me? That's a kind of overarching question. Think of it as umbrella of the EFT. Are you there for me? Right? Yes or no? It's, it's, a, it's a very black and white and dichotomous question. I always want to hear yes. Everybody wants to hear you. But then there's other question we ask. Can I count on you? Can I count on you when I need you? Am I worthy of your love? That's your romantic adult relationship that you're going to constantly ask 
yourself? Am I worthy of, of your love? In fact, there's sometimes to come a situation where love is not as important as like. So I have seen it many times where a person, I know you love me, but do you really like me? And that's where they actually get stuck. Later on, we'll learn that there's a four questions. Am I important? Do I matter? Do you care about me? Will you be there for me when I need you? But we'll start with this. So the attachment theory says, can I count on you? Am I worthy of your love? As we go into the EFT and implementation of the attachment theory with other theories, then we add additional questions. So in the secure relationship, uh, we feel comfortable depending on each other. We feel comfortable, have effective dependence on, on, dependence on our partner. We don't have to be fully independent. We don't have to be interdependent. What we can be and what works is effective dependence on each other. So in, in uh, EFT, we do not have pathology. Every behavior that a client has, it's absolutely correct based on what they're experiencing in their life, based on what they experienced in the past in their life. And it makes sense in the context of their experience, whether it's an individual experience or experience in the, in the romantic relationship they have right now. But at some point, we need to bring them to a place where they feel comfortable with closeness, with the people they love and people who love them, and need for these people. I need my wife to be there for me. And I'm effectively dependent on her in many things. And I'm hoping that my wife effectively dependent on me for her emotional needs. That's a safety we're looking for. Because the primary strategy that we have, that we always ask reassurances, right? That's a primary strategy. Reassure me that you will meet my attachment needs. And those attachment needs could be that you love me, that I'm important to you, that you value me, that you care about me, that I matter in your life, that I'm good just the way I am. I'm not too much. I'm not too little. I'm worthy of love. I'm safe. I'm not going to be abandoned. I'm not going to be neglected, right? All of these attachment needs, we need a consistent reassurance that those needs are met. If we don't have that reassurance, that we effectively go into escalation, we get unbalanced, we get stuck in this terrible cycle. And here's the thing. When our partner responds to us, we need to have internal understanding and internal felt experience that we trust that response. So response is not, it's not just to pacify us or to just say things as a matter of fact. But we can trust that what our partner says is true. And remember that trust is very segmented. And here we're taking a, a 360 degree pie chart and we're taking just a one little sliver of the chart for romantic relationship. The rest of it is the rest of your life. The 360 degree circle, that's your life. But the, most of the time, the romantic relationship is a small sliver of it. That's where the trust is important. People may have a good life and, and do everything well and have this mistrust in a romantic relationship. That mistrust would come from the prior relationship traumas, infidelity, addictions, gambling, whatever, whatever you bring to this. So we need to be able to respond. And part of our need is to trust that response. And how do we ch judge how we trust that response? We judge by the, the tone of voice, the loudness of the voice, the, the body of the expression. In a way, we're looking for congruency. Congruency between what the person feels, what they say, what they do, right? All of this needs to be congruent. If things are not congruent, we don't trust it. A good experience you will have with clients, that client would, would tell you, I don't want to hear his words. I don't want to hear her words. I want to see actions. Because in their lived experience in the relationship, there's no congruency between what the partner says, what they do, what they think, what they feel. There's no congruency. But we need to have congruency in all of these domains. When people that we love and people who we depend on are people that depend on us, if we perceive that they're inaccessible, they're unresponsive, or threatening in any way, we go into the fight or flight mode. We become vigilant. We become hypersensitive and we go into the anxiety, depression, avoidance. We get deactivated. And, and this is what the danger of the whole thing is. 
The danger is when you're not accessible to your partner, unresponsive or threatening in any way, they will go into hyperactivated anxious state. There's no around it. Or they will go into shut down, avoidant and walk away state. There's no way around it. So that means that we as a partner, our clients, as they sit in front of us, they need to learn how to avoid being inaccessible, how to avoid being unresponsive, and how to avoid not being threatening. And threatening doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotionally threatening. And many times it, it's it's a subtle statements that are mismade. It's a little jokes that people say, or they become a little critical in one area, or they or or they uh, uh, use a little words that hurt the other person. But for us, it may be simple. For a person who is doing it, it could be, oh, I'm just joking. But the first person on the receiving end may feel that threatened by this conversation. But we need to be aware how what we do and what we say and how we respond affect another person. If we can be aware of what we do, how it affects another person, we can minimize that and create safety for our partner. When we perceive an inaccess inaccessible partner, or unresponsive or threatening partner, we have two things to do. We either fight or we flight. The pursuer would fight. Okay, a pursuer person who is fighting for a relationship, they will fight. The withdrawer who protects relationship from the escalation, fight from escalation, they will flight. Now, there's another third opportunity here, and that's to freeze. It's during the headlight. Your wife talks to you and you're just frozen. You don't move, you don't do anything. You become catatonic. You wait until this barrage stops and you slowly kind of walk away. That also happens. So I would probably put together with flight or freeze. So it's a fight or flight or freeze. We know that this is what happens when, when we perceive our partner inaccessible, unresponsive or threatening. And then part of the therapeutic part of us is to help them to become responsive, accessible and engaged. So the essential elements of the secure attachment, there's uh, three of them here. And uh, one is element is regulate affect effectively. So secure attachment means that you can regulate your own affect and you can rely on your partner to help you to regulate your affect. That's where it comes effective dependence. Right? Effective dependence not only to help you in the moment of stress uh, or, or do something uh, in the house or, or, or uh, make some errands. Effective dependence means that in the moment of stress, when I'm getting dysregulated, can my partner help me to regulate my emotion? I may be able to regulate my emotions 90% of the time and not to escalate, but no one is strong enough to regulate it 100% of the time. Sometimes things get away from us and that's when we need our partner. So part of the learning that they will have is how to effectively regulate their affect. And when we effect, regulate our affect, either through our own self-regulation or by reaching out to our partner and ask them to help us or our partner recognizing that we're in distress and coming forward and saying, let me help my partner. Jack, I know you're stressed right now. Let's take a 10 minute break. I'll make you some coffee. Let's sit down, get something to eat and we'll discuss it later. Maybe that's not the time to, to go through the discussion. Um, and for me, once I'm de-escalated is to be able to say to my partner, thank you, thank you for helping me. I was going to a deep end um, I was getting angry and frustrated. The discussion didn't go well, and I appreciate that you were able to help me to go back to, to equilibrium. It really helps me to when, when you do this. And by letting a partner know that they did a good job in a way you're effectively reinforcing their behavior so the next time they will help you again. One of the difficult parts a lot of times is to accept your partner's help. And that's a danger in itself. When you're not able to effectively regulate your own affect and you're not allowing your partner to come along and help you with that, then the partner will eventually stop trying to help you. They have no choice. If there's no positive reinforcements, eventually they will pull away and say it doesn't make any difference. And then the relationship degrades. So the other the part of the secure attachment is to have a sense of confidence in, our, in ourselves. Have a self of confidence that I bring something to the relationship. I'm valued in the relationship. What I say is valid. There is nothing wrong with me. I'm not too much in too little or too little. I'm not causing this terrible tornado. We're both involved in this. 
Because when we have sense of confidence in the relationship, it translates into sense of confidence at work, with our peers, with our friends, with our relatives, with all the extended families. And that basically creates unstoppable resilience. And that's what we're looking for. Ability to maintain the sense of confidence in ourselves. We can try to do it ourselves, but in the moment when we can't, to have our partner next to us. And finally, to foster post-traumatic growth. And, and when we talk about traumatic, we talk about traumatic relationship experiences. In EFT, there is an expression called never again moments. Never again moments is a time when you need your partner and they don't show up. And then you tell yourself, never again I'm going to be vulnerable in that way. Never again I'm going to allow my partner to hurt me this way. That's a trauma. Once we, once we help them to recover from that trauma, then we want them to have a post-traumatic growth in their relationship. To feel confident, to have affect regulation to rely on their partner to ask the question are you there for me and and know unequivocally that their partner will be there for them on interpersonal level that between two people not intrapsychic which is inside yourself but interpersonal level we need to create a sense of attunement to others and that means when you see your partner stressed can you tune into that stress Instead of coming and saying, what's wrong? That's a typical response that I hear couples do. Or, is there anything wrong? Right? You already know that something's happening. The goal is to have this sensitive attunement to your partner and to, able come, to be able to come and say, I'm here for you. I see something's happening. I don't know what it is. And frank, frankly, details don't matter. We don't really need to know why you're stressed. What we need to know is that our partner has difficulty and they need our support. So a typical way to attune to your partner is to come back and say, hey, I see something's happening. I'm right here for you if you need any support. Do you need something? Uh, maybe you want to talk about this or you want to sit next to you. Maybe I can rub your back. When we attune to our partner, we don't need to ask the questions. We can attend to their needs and they will tell us what's happening once they feel safe. Empathic responsiveness. Now, empathic responsiveness is ability to respond in such a way that our partner knows that we care about them. That comes back to the same, the same questions. You know, am I worthy of your care? Am I worthy of your love? So if, if your partner is, is sharing their story at work and how difficult it is at work, to be empathic would allow you to understand that this is difficult for your partner and also accept their difficulty and validate their difficulty. Now, the empathic responsiveness does not mean you have to feel their pain because when you start feeling their pain, you're stopping being responsive to their needs because now you're dealing with your own pain. The empathic responsiveness is to be available for your partner, to accept, to reassure, and to validate. And then compassion. Compassion means that in the moment of stress, can we accept the fact that our partner is struggling? It's difficult. No matter what they say, no matter how they say, and no matter how you may disagree with this, with their position, you can be compassionate to their plight. You can be compassionate to their difficulty. In, in EFT, we call it relentless empathy, right? No matter what our partner is going through, we can empathize because at the end of it, behind the anger, frustration, shutdown, um, disappointment, there's always pain. There's a fear, there's a sadness, there's a surprise, there's, there's just um, so many things that are coming up for them. So chances are, on the face of the, uh, of the argument, you may see an angry person or frustrated, a person who dismisses you. But when we go to the elevator and push the button that goes down to the basement, we know that something is hurting. And then openness to people who are perceived as different from ourselves. And this is an important part. In the relationship, you're not marrying the person 
or, or being a boyfriend, girlfriend, or uh, having an intimate relationship, your partner will have lived different experience. That lived different experience will inform them differently at the same moment in time and at the same experience. And they will be informed about this experience differently. And therefore, they may behave differently. So because of this, can we be open to their experience without judging their experience, without criticizing their experience, without rejecting their experience? Because their experience is as valid as ours. A lot of times in the relationship, we judge our partner by our own standards, by our own experience, how I would behave in certain way, what I would do in certain way. When our partner shares with us something, we may say, well, don't do this. That was stupid. Why would you do this? Why would you say that to your coworker? Or why would you do this uh, and uh, go to a store and uh, buy something? But to be open to the experience and say, well, sounds like that was a difficult experience for you. What's, what's happening? Do you want to talk about it? Or do you want to go out and you know, go to a coffee shop, sit down? Or do you want to sit down here? What, what, what's happening? In a way, accepting their experience even though it's different between yours experience. And there are some uh, videos on Facebook that uh, came across uh, my feed. And, uh, you know, every time you search about something on Facebook, then the next 25 videos are going to be connected to what you just searched for, okay? <laughs> and it's kind of crazy, but they feed you what you're asking to feed, be fed. And, uh, there was one video where the uh, one partner was chilling with their mouth open. And they're making the sound. And the other partner was chewing with their mouth closed. And both thought that the other partner is crazy. Right? Both were upset at each other. You, you can't enjoy the food if you keep you if you eat food with your mouth closed, right? That's one partner is saying, and the other partner is saying, This is rude when you eat with, with your mouth open. That's not acceptable. Where did you learn this? But the point is, people come from different walks of life. I've known I've known people and I've met many on businesses that I uh, I've been doing business meetings. I learned that uh, there's different traditions, different styles, different views. In some places, if you don't make noise when you eat, you're not enjoying food. But the other person can live in their, relation, in, in their family where they enjoyed that. Uh, there's actually a study that shows that when you eat with your mouth open, the food tastes better. And it, you can search for that study. But there's something to say about eating food with your mouth closed so that it's comfortable for everybody else around you. But to have the openness of your experience, uh, of having your lived experience and be open to your partner's lived experience without judging them, without criticizing them, with, without pigeonholing them in a place and saying, you are this type of person because you do this. From the theoretical point of view, and that's what we're discussing right now, this is important. Now, how do we do practical work here? It's kind of a very simple with EFT. Once you start using EFT, most of this can be resolved quite easily. You don't tell them what they're doing wrong. You share with them how it affects you. No partner wants to make their partner suffer. We don't want to make our partner suffer. If, if I'm chewing with my mouth open and my partner says, you know, when you do this, this is what happens to me. And you share it, non, non-threatening, non, not blaming, not criticizing. This is what happens to me. I'm not asking you to change anything, but I just want you to know what's happening for me. Right? And you talk about your experience in these moments. There is no way that behavior will not change. If I'm the partner and I'm chewing and you're not chewing, I will become aware of what I do, how it affects you. Once I'm aware how it affects you, in the moment when I do it, I will know what's happening and I can adjust it. But if you don't have awareness, if it's only fighting, then I would feel that I'm not loved just the way I am. I'm not important just the way I am. I have to change myself for my partner to care about me and love me. And that's a tough ask. We can't force the change in our partner. It's not possible. The more we try to change our partner by telling them to change, the harder it's going to be for them to change. The only way is through corrective emotional experience. And corrective emotional experience is by sharing what, how, how, what they do affect them. That becomes into their awareness. Next time it happens, they start chewing and they recognize, wait a minute, I think my partner is going to experience distress. And then they change their behavior. Because I can guarantee you one thing. Most of the people who make noises when they eat and everything, they're not aware how they affect other people. Because for them, it's a lived experience. It's good to go, right? We did everything in our home this way. 
And once in a while, the person may forget about this and they still do this. Okay, fine. That's not a problem. But some things are physical things, like some, some, sometimes people who eat, they, when they swallow, it's a loud swallow, you know, it's, you can hear this. Some things you can't change. There's nothing you can do to change it. Even if they're aware of it, they may take small bites and they may take something. Awareness will help to bring it back. But we need to also develop a tolerance a tolerance to the other people's behavior, especially a person who is romantically connected with you and attached with you. Some of the things we develop tolerance to, and we still love them. There, there are many examples of, of, of what people do to annoy each other, and people fight over this a lot. But when you're in the therapy setting, when you bring it up and say, it seems like you grew up in completely different environments. What seems like normal for you, John, seems quite abnormal, abnormal for you, Jolene, and you get guys gonna get into this small fights over these things but it seems to me that both of your experience is valid both of you grew up in a certain way but in the moment it's hard it's hard to accept your partner's experience is that what's happening to you both and from there we start to navigating for them to share their experience when this happens how it affects them where they go and the other partner receives it understands it and says i didn't know that how it affects you i didn't realize how difficult it is for you but I see it right now, right here. And that brings awareness. But at the same time, the person who is critical or wants the behavior to stop also need to look at themselves and say, what can I do to tolerate that experience? That's where it kind of realm how we work on EFT. Attachment security and mental health on in the personal level includes tendency to be altruistic. Give without expecting anything in return. That's a big thing in a relationship. Can we do something for a partner without asking for reciprocity, but being there for them? But in the, in our hearts, you know, we know that they care about us and they love us. So that's kind of interpersonal level. In a way, for EFT, we work both on interpersonal level, how we interact with that with other, but we also need to look into intra personal level, internal, that means psychedelic, internal struggle within yourself. And part of it is we learn how to tolerate some things. Nothing wrong with this. There was a good uh, movie, Good Will Hunting. Remember uh, Robert William? He was a, a therapist in that movie. And he said that, I love my wife. I love my wife with all her idiosyncrasies. And everything that she did was kind of weird and queer and, 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 and uncomfortable, but I loved her, right? That's his view of tolerating. This is you accepting, turning the differences between themselves into something that this is my part. That's what makes this person unique. So when we regulate the affect, one thing we want to do is to stay with the emotion. We don't pull away from emotions and go into the reactivity or go into the shutdown mode. So if I feel angry, I need to go through anger. I need to say that to my partner, I feel like I feel really angry right now. I will, you know, I want to escalate. I want to scream. I want to say, how can it be done? How could could you do this? But I know I'm going to hurt us. So I want to pull back, and let's take a break for 15 minutes so I can come back and be there for you, and you can be, help me with my emotion. We want to be able to regulate our affect, and when we can't regulate internally, we're going to ask our partner to help us to regulate because we have affective dependence. So we want to have the emotion that guides us in our life. If I feel angry, there's a reason for feeling angry. It's absolutely true to me. There's nothing wrong with it. We don't have to fight my anger. It shows up as a protective. Most of the time, all these big emotions, frustration, disappointment, anger, the shutdown, they're all big emotions that help us in some way. They're trying to help us. Now, at the end, they're not helping us. They're hurting us. But the intention for these emotions to help us. So we need to get through these emotions. We need to make friends with those emotions. We can't disregard them. We can't shut down them. We can't push them inside and, and try to just deal with them. We need to go through them. So you can come in from the other side and feel safe, connected, loving, and caring. And, and that means a lot of times when you have these emotions is to be able to say them out loud without blaming your partner, without um, creating an environment where uh, the other person feels threatened in any way. In therapeutic side, side of this is, can we help 
for partners to come together in the moment of stress without hurting each other and be able to stop the escalation and then regroup and rebuild their relationship and heal the trauma. That, that's what we're looking for. And to do this, you have to go through emotions. That means you don't reject those emotions. Whatever comes for you, whether it's a frustration, disappointment, disgusting, um, you take it in and say, it's showing you up here for, for purpose. I do a lot of self-talk myself. I like to do self-talk. They say, yeah, yeah, right now it feels kind of sucks right now. What does sucks mean? Um, probably, uh, probably I'm worried. What am I worried about? I'm worried about losing disorder, for example. I'm worried about... And, uh, and me being worried about disorder, I'm probably going to affect people who work around me. Okay, Jack, take a deep breath. Go to the restroom, or wash your face, come back. Here you are. All right, let's go, guys. Right? You can do a lot of self-talk. But I, what, I, what also helps me is to understand that when I come home, I can share this experience with my wife, and she will help me with this. I don't have to be alone in this. But there's a lot of times you're alone without you, your partner being next to you. So learning how to self-regulate is really important skill. You can't always rely on your partner. But in the moment when you self-regulate, part of it is, can I put it on hold when I come home? My partner will help me. That's, that's part of the work. So the EFT theory of intervention and change, right? So how do we intervene with our couples? How do we help them to navigate from stressful place to a place of connection and love and care for each other? Now, remember that in EFT, the efficacy rate is 75%. That's what's been studied. 75% of the couples completely recover from their distress in their relationship. 90% of the uh, couples um, uh, report significant improvement in their relationship. But there's 10% of the couples that we cannot help. And I don't want you to ever get into a place where when something doesn't work right with a couple, that you get discouraged. Um, couples can come with different agendas to, this, to, to, the, to the therapy. Um, couples have different view of life. Um, couples can come at the time in their life when there's really they're at the point of no return. And no matter what you try, it may not work. Right? But let's take a, take a look at what, uh, what change occurs. How do we do this? Right? So the one most important thing with couples is alliance. This is the key. It all starts with alliance. And I don't think that um, EFT has a, uh, has a hold on that. Pretty much any type of modality you work with you need to start with alliance, connecting with the clients, joining their system, understanding their experience, validating them, reassuring them, using unrelenting empathy, right? But also ability to repair the alliance. In any situation that you have with your the client, there could be a situation where you lose alliance. Whether you're culturally incompetent in certain ways and, and you say something that may uh, create distance between you and your clients, uh, whether you uh, mention something that violates their core beliefs or core, core values, right? You, can, you may lose the connection there. Uh, maybe you said something in a tone of voice that reminded them of their parent. So they, there is a transference. Maybe there's a content transference. All of these will threaten the alliance, right? So one of the important things is for us to constantly be vigilant. Is my alliance still unbroken? Is something happening there that can break the alliance? And then repair it as needed. And we'll, we'll talk about it in the next uh, uh, series, the next uh, time we, we have presentation. The other thing is our stance. Our stance as a therapist is optimistic. We root for our clients to succeed. We believe in our clients to succeed, that they will succeed and they rebuild their relation and become strong. We give them hope. Right, the outcome of the there's lots of studies that've been done, and the outcome of the session and outcome of the therapy relies on hope. Does the client has a hope that they will succeed? And because of this, our part of our work is we need to instill this hope. 
we need to help them to have hope that what they do changes their life. What they do will help them to reconnect and be close to each other. So from us, we're always optimistic. Why we're optimistic? Because when they show in our, when they show up in our therapy room, that's good enough for us. That's our hope. They show up and they decide to spend an hour and a half, and, and an hour and a half with us, focusing just on each other. That's the biggest hope that we can have as a therapist that they're fighting for their relationship. And therefore, we're going to draw the, the strength from them showing up and give them back the optimism and uh, that, that we believe in them. They will succeed. We also don't pathologize uh, our clients, no matter what their interaction cycle is. Now, for the purposes of doing therapy and insurance and, and other things, uh, for a prometic and legal point of view, we do need to diagnose the couples. There's no way around it. And within the couples, do we, need, we can even diagnose individual uh, partners with whatever they may have, right? And we discussed with clients, uh, but from the perspective of AFT and, and everything we're gonna do with the clients, we don't assume pathology and we don't pigeonhole them in specific space. Um, that's why that uh, in, in EFT, the active um, psychological disorder is counterindicative to the EFT work, right? That's not something that we can do. We can help with simple, we can help with depression, anxiety, that, that we can manage, but if, there, if there's a, some psychotic elements of it, uh, we're not be, we should not be doing it until that's taken care of through medication or any other way. So um, the other thing is that's important is that the health of the relationship and health of the therapy uh, relies on being open and engaged. Our clients coming in, we will help them to be open, but they also have to have that sense that I'm coming here to get support and I'm going to be open and engaged during the work, right? And, and the problem is if they're not open and engaged, they may have different agenda. Um, and at the end, both partners can get hurt. So we don't want to get into that place. So um, we will assess their openness and engagement during the first session. We see how they interact and uh, we will help them to maintain that openness. And this is especially important when there is a infidelity involved or some kind of uh, traumatic event in the relationship that's, that's involved, right? When there's a loss of trust and we have to make partners vulnerable to regain the trust, we need to know that they're engaged and open. But the other thing part of the EFT work is a moment to moment process. We don't process anything in the past and we don't process anything in the future, right? So if, you, if, you, if you've done the uh, solution focused approach, right? You would probably say miracle questions and, and, and the client can predict the future, right? If you do psychodynamic or, or you do cognitive behavior, you can understand what's happening in the past. In AFT, we bring the past to the present and process their emotional experience in the present. We take the fear of the future and bring it to the present and process their fears and worries in the present. And during all this work, we privilege emotions, not the behavior, not the cognition, we privilege emotions. Emotion is the one that causes the action tendency to do things. And we're going to work with emotions and help them to process emotional experience through a corrective emotional experience. And that's the agent of change. That's what changes the dynamics, corrective emotional experience. And the corrective emotional experience uh, means that experientially, you can show your client how they can interact differently. And when they interact differently, they succeed. Once they succeed in interacting, that creates corrective emotional experience. And then you reinforce this. And once it gets reinforced a number of times, they take that experience to their home, 
and do the same thing at home. That's the, that's a goal. We can definitely process a client's childhood experience in the context of their relationship. If they need to process their um, childhood experience that interfering with their relationship, we can do that with their, with their partner staying with them. But if they need to work through their, their childhood, that would be better to, to, to recommend to go to individual therapy. I don't spend the whole session just working on one client on their childhood experience because that does not help the interaction in their relationship experience. Spend maybe 30 minutes on that and try to reach out to that uh, child that's struggling to connect and how it affects it in the present relationship. And I may even use the other partner to come along and say and help that child to feel safe, right? Because maybe that child didn't feel safe with their father or their brother or somebody else, right? But today she's in a relationship with another person that's a romantic relationship. Can that person show up and say, I can see when you were 12 year old, 12 year old how difficult it was for you. And mm -hmm. I want to reassure I'm right here. I wasn't there for you because I was not around at the time you were young. At the time that little girl got hurt, but I'm here to keep you safe. Right, so you can do this type of enactments to help that part of your partner's life to feel safe. Because a lot of times people who have childhood experiences, a lot of times they hate that person who represent that part of them that represent childhood experience. Because it created a lot of distress for them, for them right? So mm -hmm. part of the work that needs to be done is to, to make friends with that child who got hurt. But we've been spending so much time in our life pushing it down and saying, I don't want you to be here, it's causing too much stress, go away. But the more you do this, the, the stronger the child becomes. And eventually it inter interferes with your romantic relationship, with your uh, parent relationship, friends relationship. It interferes everywhere with your work. But the majority bulk of the processing, I would leave it to individual therapist. And I, and I refer people. When we get stuck in situations, I refer people and I said, sometimes you get stuck when, when a childhood experience interferes with the relationship work. Some things need to have uh, full-time attention uh, in a couple's therapy. There are studies after studies, and if you want, I will show you the studies that show that when a relationship, partner relationship improves, the uh, depression decreases, people feel more connected, feel safe. When you have effective dependence, you remove a lot of the stresses, your anxiety goes away, your depression goes away. Because mm -hmm. you know when you get hurt in the outside world or something happens to you, you come home, you know your partner is there for you. There's an internal safety that you come at home and there's a partner for you there. Now, the danger in this, if they don't do individual therapy, you don't want their partner to become a caregiver. If you have this consistent anxiety and depression or some other symptoms, personality disorders, when your partner becomes your caregiver, romantic part disappears. It's very difficult to have romantic partner when you become a caregiver. And after, after a while, the relationship will suffer quite a bit. So to avoid this, we want to be there for our partners when they need us, but it cannot be every day, every single day of our lives. Systemic model, I think this is the last slide. In the systemic model, one of the things that's a Salvador Mnuchin, what we see in, in, in clients that causality of their distress is always circular. There's no re linear correlation between or relation between I did this and it caused you to do this. Because most of the time in couple relationship, we both are responsible for our dance. That's why we call it we're dancing a tango, right? We're both responsible for our moves. Therefore, linear causality doesn't, doesn't exist in emotional focus therapy. It's always circular. When I do this, you do this, you do this, I, it, it affects me. What affects me affects you. And what affects you affects me. And, and that's how the circle kind of goes around. We must consider behavior in the context of partner's interaction. We can't consider behavior by talking to one partner and not knowing what the other partner's part of it is. So in systemic model, we need to look at both partners and how they contribute to the interaction. Now, what's important about this, when you go to individual therapists, 
they can they they're considered just your view in a way individual therapists are, are a bit handicapped right they have two hands be, behind their back because they don't know anything about your partner everything they hear is from what you tell them and you can have cognitive distortions you can have other things by the time you tell it to a therapist it could be quite different that's why if you have emotionally focused individual therapist they understand interaction in the context of the relationship and they can heal your childhood trauma in the context of the relationship too we must consider behavior in the context in a systemic model we want to make sure that all the elements of the therapy are predictable and we can understand the pattern and how the people interact with each other and that's why we say in EFT, it's the cycle's fault. You didn't cause the cycle, you didn't cause the cycle. In the moment when we try to reconnect and we use the wrong, wrong strategy, like being angry, frustrated, or shutting down, walking away, the cycle starts and it has the power. Once the cycle has the power, it has its own life. Most people can't fight the cycle on their own. You can't do a surgery on yourself and, and uh, think that you're going to survive it. It doesn't work this way. That's why most of the couples tend to stay uh, for years and years in this dysfunctional interaction cycle and they don't go for help because they think they can beat it. They can actually change it. But most of the time, once the cycle sets in, it's autopilot turns on, that's it, you're done. No matter what you do, you can't escape it unless there's an intervention. When we come in as a therapist, we don't know lived experience of the people we work with. We don't know one hundredth percent of their experience. We're not experts on their day-to-day -day life. We're experts on how to interrupt the cycle, how to provide a safe exit from the terrible tornado that, that caused the distress. So all of the behaviors are communicative, have a communicative aspect. Okay. And that means we have what and how we say things affect our communication. Not only the words, which we, a lot of times we say the words uh, are important, right? But not only the words, the tone of voice, the speed at which you talk, the intonations, the facial expression, right? All of that, of that affects our cycle. It affects our communication part. So we can't just focus on what he said and what she said. That's irrelevant. What we focus on, all the other things that happen at the same time. Because it's a meaning that it holds, not the words. The meaning that those words hold are much more important than the words themselves. And finally, our task as therapists is to interrupt the negative cycles. This is our job. We interrupt the negative cycles until we're able to help clients to develop more adaptive patterns, how to relate to each other. In a way, what we want to do is to turn negative cycle into the positive cycle. And the positive cycle, you attend to your partner's need, you attend to their distress, you connect, you heal the trauma, you heal the relationship difficulties, and you're available for each other so that you can live another day together. That's a goal. And most of the time, we cannot avoid the, the fights in the couple's relationship. It happens all the time. It doesn't matter how good you are in AFT, in your personal relation, relationship, you're still gonna have fights. The question becomes how fast can we recognize that fight is hurting us? How fast we can stop it? And how fast we can come back and heal each other and feel connected again. That's our goal. So what you see in AFT, not that the fight stops, but the intensity of the fights will decrease significantly. And the distance between fights will increase. So instead of, instead of having fights you know, every single day, you may have fights maybe once a month, once every three, four weeks. But even when they happen, you can recover quickly, heal each other, and move on with your life. So what we're looking for, extending the time between the cycles, and the intensity of the cycles should be low. So it doesn't hurt you. An ability to recognize when we're getting into the cycle. That's why when we do therapy, a lot of times we go every week. And then when we 
want to test how things are working, we're gonna start seeing our clients once every two weeks. Can they sustain therapy with a, without being in therapy for two weeks and be able to uh, uh, handle their cycles? And then eventually we'll go once every, once every three weeks and eventually we say goodbye and we're done. Okay, because once they're able to stay for three weeks without a fight, great. Or if they have a fight, they, have the, they told us how they were able to resolve it, great. Then we're coming to the end of the therapy. We are finished with the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.